Abin Resources Limited is a gold exploration company with significant projects in British Columbia and the Yukon. Trading on the TSX Venture Exchange, symbol ABN, and the OTCQB, symbol ABNAF. Surrounded by world-class gold deposits and mines, Avon's 23,000 hectares Forest Kerr Gold Project is located in the heart of the Golden Triangle in northwestern BC. For more information, visit us at avonresources.com. You're listening to HowStreet.com Radio, available online at TalkDigitalNetwork.com. Welcome to HowStreet.com Radio, the online source for market opinions. Here is Jim Goddard. My guest is David Skarika, founder of the Addicted to Profits newsletter online at AddictedToProfits.net. He writes for the Financial Intelligence Report. He's speaking to us from the Bahamas. Welcome back to the show, David. Yeah, I'm pretty good, or as good as you can be in these times. <laughs> David, uh, the traditional stock market seemed to have picked up with the NASDAQ fading a bit. Well, what's kind of interesting about the stock market, there's two things I think are really going on. Remember the last few years before this all happened, the entire thing in the stock market used to be that trade deal with China, that when people were worried about Trump starting a trade war or et cetera, um, uh, um, the market would sell off, and then he'd say they were near a deal, or they'd sign some kind of short-term deal, and then it would rally. Well, now the vaccine has become the new trade deal, right? It, it, uh, you know, well, one company will say they're testing something, and, and the market will kind of rally on that news, and we're seeing the economy opening up a little bit, but, you know, it's opening up some little skeptical of, you know, it's like, who wants to go to a restaurant wearing masks and having dividers and all kinds of stuff, right? But, you know, and then traveling we know is going to be a pain, et cetera, right? So, um, so it's like it's called opening up, but it's not really opening up. Um, so um, I think there's all these factors where it's like the market is just thinking almost like everything's returning to normal, and I don't really think it is. And so I think this is also a long-term secular trend starting where people's spending habits and, and lifestyle habits are going to change. So that's, you know, a lot of the market's excessive valuation pre-COVID was based on this kind of, you know, extreme consumer-based society, which I think is now kind of uh, shifting. So, anyhow, so I think, like I said, these vaccine news um, and opening news, it's kind of like, I think you're going to want to, like, you know, sell the news. You know, you know <laughs> I guess you could uh, buy the quarantine and sell the opening. I guess you could say, <laughs> like, this summer, I think when all these, uh, when everything kind of is, isn't as locked down and it's obvious, hey, the economy really changed and not as active as it was, that's when I think the market will begin to kind of roll over. And then, you know, even if some of the tests on these vaccines do well, it will take six months to 12 months to put them into, you know, into motion. And if there's a little spike again in the fall when flu season starts again, it, you know, none of these vaccines will be ready anyhow, you know. And you have to produce millions and millions and millions of doses. And the thing is, too, and I hate to say this because, you know, I'm not one of these anti-American people at all, but the one thing where I, I really suspicious in the United States is their whole pharmaceutical healthcare industry. Like, um, one of the country, uh, one of the companies, sorry, that, um, uh, had positive results a few days later, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna keep them unnamed. Uh, some of the, um, uh, uh, uh the board members sold $29 million worth of stock on the spike, right? So the problem I have in the U.S. is, these companies are really just looking to make money off this vaccine and not really doing it. And you know, I'm the biggest capitalist libertarian of all time. And I, you know, you got me talking like this, but they're not really doing it for, for the good of the world. And, uh, and then that, that's going to bring scammers. And you know, as we saw in the financial crisis, the I- issue with, with these scammers is, um, you know, they're not going to, whatever, they dump their stock. They're not going to get charged. Not gonna get, nothing's going to happen to them. So I think you're going to see a lot of pump and dumps based on that. The only one I see being realistic is in the UK, there's a three-way um, uh, venture going between the British government, Oxford University, and AstraZeneca. And as a disclosure, I'm long AstraZeneca. And the, the thing I like about that uh, vaccine testing is Oxford has no profit motive, right? They just basically get, they'll get a percentage and it'll help funding their institution there. And they started it in January because when it first broke out, where everyone else has just jumped on the bandwagon kind of the last month or so. 
So they're way ahead, everyone. And Oxford even came out and said that it would be very difficult to mass produce it by September, October. So I think they're being much more honest than these kind of American companies, which I think are pumping and dumping. So um, that's another thing to kind of watch out for. And let's face it, we all saw what happened after 9-11. Even if there is a vaccine, look, the vaccine is not foolproof. You get your flu shot, it doesn't prevent you from getting the flu. It just re- reduces the effects if you do get it. So it, well, all a vaccine could do is maybe, like, you'll get half a sick or, 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 or three, one quarter a sick, you know, if you, you know, do have a bad reaction to getting COVID. So I don't believe this this whole thing. And they're still going to make you wear masks and social distance. And, again, I go back to 9-11, how they overreacted with security after 9-11. This is even worse. They're going to overreact like crazy. And I think when people see this, again, quote, unquote, opening up this new world, it, you know, it's not going to be fun. You're not going to want to go to a restaurant. You're not going to want to go to a casino. You're not going to want to travel because it's just going to be so much, uh, you know, it's going to be such a pain in the butt for the next year or two to do it. Um, the, the, you know, tourism and all that stuff is going to be, uh, way down. And I think that this fall is when, or between now, this fall and maybe early next year is when the market's going to realize that again. And by the way, there's a great indicator. We've talked about this in the past. Um, the Buffett indicator, market cap to GDP, because GDP has collapsed and the markets had this bounce back, it's now higher basically than it was at the top of the market in February, right? <laughs> so the market as compared to the economy is is completely overvalued. We'll have more with David Skarika right after this. Engineer Gold Mines is focused on the exploration and development of the historic high-grade Engineer Gold Mine situated 32 kilometers southwest of Atlin, British Columbia. Engineer Gold Mines is fully permitted for surface and underground exploration with the drill program now underway. Engineer Gold Mines Limited trades on the TSX Venture Exchange, symbol EAU. For more information, please visit us at engineergoldmines.com. Cypress Development Corp. is developing a world-class lithium resource in the heart of Clayton Valley, Nevada. The size of the resource makes the Clayton Valley project a premier asset with the potential to impact the future of lithium supply. Cypress Development Corp. trades on the TSX Venture Exchange, symbol CYP, the OTCQB, symbol CYDVF, and on Frankfurt, symbol C1Z1. For more information, please visit our website, cypressdevelopmentcorp.com. Welcome back. We're speaking with David Skarika. David, what's going on with gold and silver? Well, I think we're in a consolidation mode. I hate to be, I, I wish it could be more exciting, but, um, you know, seasonally, this is even in bull markets, this is kind of when it slows down a bit. I'm not looking for really sharp or long pullbacks, but I could definitely see, I think we're in this kind of, like I said, this delusional mode right now where people think, oh, the economy is just opening up again. There's going to be a vaccine in the fall and people think things are going to come back as normal. And, um, and, and, uh, and I think what, when you're seeing that in the market is actually like these kind of stocks like Zoom or some of the pharmaceutical companies that led the way, you know, during the, uh, when the market was going down or just rebounded because they were the ones benefiting from the lockdowns. They're being sold off. And then the companies that were hardest hit, like airlines or, or, um, casinos or, or uh, cruise, cruise companies, they're the ones rallying because, you know, people are expecting, oh, yeah, if there's a recovery, the, you know, they're moving money into those. So I think gold and silver, which also benefited from kind of a flight to safety or flight to quality or whatever you want to call it, is kind of seeing this, um, you know, consolidation as well. And there's been a huge move. The gold stocks have done great, you know. And, you know, gold gold rallied to, you know, over 1750 So I think now we can just pull back here for a little bit. And then really, if, that, if I'm correct, and there's this rollover in the market in the late summer into the fall and winter, um, I think gold will actually, it, it will disconnect from the market. It's not going to be, like, it's not going to get flushed out like it did in March. Because now gold, if you actually look at it, again, with the market being up the last few days, gold sold off. I think it's now trading counter to the market, like it did from 2000 to 2002 or like it did in the 70s. So I think gold will actually catch a huge bid when it's obvious that will happen. And part of that bid will be the anticipation that, oh, the economy isn't getting any better, even if the virus doesn't come back in the fall, and they have to print more money. They're going to have to do more stimulus. Maybe the next round of stimulus in the fall will be um, um, uh, an, infra- an infrastructure uh, project, which will bring demand for metals and commodities, which is, you know, maybe more inflationary, and or maybe a permanent 
you know, universal basic in- income to support the people that are long-term unemployed. And I think that's when gold and silver can really, really move. Like right now, during this consolidation, is the time to kind of position yourself. We'll have more with David Skarika right after this. Media recognition from Bloomberg, Reuters, Recycling Trade Publications, patented process for 100% recovery of critical metals, including cobalt, lithium, nickel, manganese, aluminum. American Manganese is focused on recycling lithium-ion batteries for electric vehicles. American Manganese trades on the TSX Venture, AMY, the US, AMYZF, and Frankfurt 2AM. For more information, visit AmericanManganeseInc.com or phone me, Larry Ray, at 778-574-4444. Don't miss out. Stay informed. Receive the HowStreet.com weekly recap with thought-provoking podcasts, radio, and articles delivered to your inbox. Sign up for the HowStreet.com weekly recap on our homepage at HowStreet.com. Welcome back. We're chatting with David Skarika. David, what's going on with crude oil? I hear Russia may not cut back production as much as they promised. Um... Well, we've seen a nice little rebound to 35. One thing that's interesting about uh, crude oil is, you know, it looks like the real oversupply really came from the states, right? Because this fracking boom and the the states went on complete lockdown. And now that they're self-sufficient, once, you know, the the, the demand collapsed, um, you know, um, they just didn't have the storage space to do it. And um, remember, globally, oil, I think, demand is down like 30%. So that's kind of, kind of funny thing. We're almost actually, in our back of our minds, we almost think, you know, if oil went negative, we're like, you, know, you would think the demand was down 80%. Well, maybe in some economies that totally shut down it is. But actually, remember, a lot of economies in Asia and um, Africa, you know, like uh, South America, haven't totally shut down. So, you know, there is still this kind of base demand for oil and natural gas. You know, like if you have remember, a lot of power around the uh, world, is run on natural gas or diesel or something like that. So there's, you know, even if you're stuck in your house and you're, especially in your, a warm place like, you know, Florida or I live in the Bahamas and our power plants here are diesel, it's like, you know, you're stuck in your house, you're actually going to probably run your AC more. And, and, and that will, like, you kind of make up a little bit for the demand that's not happening in, in your car or from a plane, you know. So um, I think I've seen uh, oil, see, oil in the 30s is kind of a sweet spot for them too. Because the ruble's falling a lot, so they're getting a lot more oil in term in ruble terms. And a third in the thirties, the frackers still can't make any money. So Russia can kind of keep its head above water and then still maybe put the frackers out of business at the same time. So I think that's kind of what they're looking at. And I think that's what um Putin was trying to do back in March when they didn't when they didn't cut production. But what happened was this kind of extreme collapse in global economic activity, um, you know, due to COVID kind of put, you know, a hinge in that plan, and they did have to cut um, a bit more. So I, I still think so. I've never bought that Saudi Arabia and Russia are fighting. I, I bought more that it was a fake fight because they're trying to put the frackers out of business. What do you think's going on with uh, real estate, uh, especially here in Canada where we seem to have leaned on real estate more than other countries did except perhaps Australia? Well, we're kind of in this interesting scenario. First of all, there is a geopolitical thing going on where now it looks like uh, China is going to start, you know, um, you know, uh, I guess, uh, hunkering down on Hong Kong. And there's 300,000 people in Hong Kong that have Canadian citizenship. So I think a lot of them might just come back to Canada. I, I, I would assume that a lot of them already own homes in Canada because those tend to be wealthy people. But if they don't, they might just start buying them. So that might put a little buffer, especially in Toronto and uh, Vancouver. Um, you know, but on the other hand, the problem is the Canadian consumer is so indebted and the your mortgage payments is a percentage of their income, et cetera, is so high that you know losing income for just a few months means that most of them can't pay. And right now we have, you know, the government Trudeau giving two thousand dollars to everybody. Um, you know, we have you know inflated um, uh, uh, unemployment insurance payouts. And so everyone's okay right now, and then the banks are only maybe um, charging, I think, uh, interest uh, for six months or something like that. So this is all short-term orientated, though. And I think in the fall, when because the government can't keep doing this, you know, forever. At some point, that has to stop. 
when you know, and when your unemployment turns into welfare or even that basic income, which is going to be much lower, that's when I think you're going to have the real credit problems in the housing market, and you will see the housing market kind of whacked uh, due to that. I personally think if they wanted to solve this problem, and I don't see this happening, but this would make sense to me, is that you do what's called a j- debt jubilee. So you could extend everyone's mortgage, you know, double or triple the length of it, so you cut to the principal um, and interest payment, you know, um, and, and people can afford it, even making a lot less money. Or you just cut everyone's mortgage in half, and then the federal government can just backstop some of the banks that would uh, have losses due to that. And I think that's a lot better idea, you know, even though, you know, uh, it's not pure capitalism at all, but if you were going to, you know, we all know the government's going to get involved anyhow, and this is not laissez-faire anymore. That is a lot better idea than just throwing money, you know, uh, giving people money, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, just, just say, hey, you know what? It doesn't matter if you only have a hundred thousand dollar mortgage or three hundred thousand or five hundred thousand or a million, you know, the banks will just cut it by, I don't know, a third or stretch it out another 10 years. And then it makes it so people can afford it through this kind of uh, a bad time. But I don't think that is going to happen. And I think at some point the day of reckoning is coming. And even with that kind of model that I just mentioned, I don't think it would save Toronto and Vancouver because the prices are just too inflated and too high. And, um, and remember, one of the uh, the non um, the non banks um, uh, loaners, um, you know, subprime loaners, they're thirty percent of the market in Canada, and those are high interest rate loans. Those aren't the three four percent, you know, a line of credits or the whatnot. Those are, you know, double or triple that. And I, those are the type of people that are really going to lose their jobs and be hit hard by this. And I think you'll see a lot of those go under, just like a lot of the subprime lenders in 2006, 2007 went under in the United States. David, are you going to start up uh, your old school football league or <laughs> website? Yeah, I'm, tr- I'm sorry, man. I'm editing a book that's coming out in the fall. So that that has remained kind of on the backlog, um, but I am going to do that. Um, I'm uh, I'm going to I'm going to um, I think I'll aim for the first of June, and that. So what that is, this is kind of a fun side venture. We talked about this off air last time. So I'm a huge football fan, and um, I'm a huge historical uh, fan, and I actually kind of don't like the way it's played now. With I like I'm and I'm a Raiders fan, so I like late hits, and dirty play, and stuff like that. You know, stick them. And um, so, yeah, what I'm going to do is start an old school football site where I every day I link to like a player or a great game or a great moment and then give a little paragraph expl- explanation on it and then link to the highlight film. Uh, and then also on top of that, uh, the island I live on is actually Sam Spence used to live here and he wrote all the music for the NFL films. And I was really good friends with him near the end of his life. And then also my um, my principal in grammar school was a guy named Bernie Custis. He used to play for the Tie Cats and he's in the Hall of Fame. He was actually Al Davis's roommate in college. And that's part of the reason I became a Raiders fan is because Bernie was my principal and uh, he was good friends with Al. So, um, and he used to coach, uh, McMaster as well in Canada. So I'm going to talk about, you know, people like that and, uh, you know, some funny stories and, and kind of the more political incorrect days where you could be a character in, a, in an athlete, right? So, um, yeah, I, I'm going to try it. My, I, I think my goal will be the uh, in about a week, maybe the week after we do this podcast, maybe in early June, because sports are still going to be shut down for a while. They're starting some of the soccer leagues up in Europe. Um, but I don't know. Major League Baseball looks like, I don't know, these guys don't want to take pay cuts. And um, you know, screw them, by the way. Yeah, we got you got twenty five percent unemployment, and these these millionaires won't take fifty percent pay cuts. Like, who cares about those guys? But it does look like the NFL will go. But still, for the next few months, other than some European soccer, it doesn't look like much is going to go on sports wise. So, um, I got to start the site up so to give people some sports content. Well, uh, I have Jack Tatum's book. They call me assassin. He's the one who put the hit on Daryl Stingley that paralyzed him, the receiver from... Which, the, by the way, wasn't a dirty hit, if you ever see it. That's yes, totally it wasn't. Clean. Yeah, it wasn't. But, if, but you Jack, actually, if you actually... Sorry, watch the hit. Stingley ducks his head. Yeah. He should have done that, and that's what actually got him paralyzed, you know? 
Oh, go on, sorry. I, I was going to say, though, uh, yeah, it is uh, old-time football, and everybody had a nickname, Kenny the Snake Stabler. Uh, nowadays, who's got nicknames? Well, the, the, the whole Raiders uh, secondary is great because you had, um, he was, you know, you had, you had, he was the assassin, and then a, a guy named George Atkinson was the headhunter because his move is he would clothesline you. Oh, right? yeah. And then Skip Thomas might have been the biggest character of all of them. He was Dr. Death. And he never did an interview. And then when NFL Films, you know, the end of his life, did an interview with him, they, they realized why. Because every second word out of Skip's mouth was like a curse word. <laughs> so, <laughs> you know, and then actually, I have this great picture I just found of um, uh, Lester Hayes. with yeah, He's drinking a, like a Coke out of one of those old wax, uh, you know, the cups. And the cup is like stuck to his hands with all the stickum he used to have. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Good times. David, thank you so much for chatting with us. Yeah, thanks for having me. My guest has been David Skarika, founder of the Addicted to Profits newsletter online at addictedtoprofits.net. If you have any questions for David or any of our other guests, you can send them to info at howstreet.com. Our YouTube channel is Talk Digital Network. Find us on Twitter at How Street. We're also on Facebook. I'm Jim Goddard. Thank you for listening. Comments made on HowStreet.com radio are an expression of opinion only and should not be construed in any matter whatsoever as recommendations to buy or sell any financial instrument at any time. Available online at TalkDigitalNetwork.com, HowStreet.com radio is a production of HowStreet Media Incorporated.